on to the parish notices before I introduce our speaker. Uh, they, I'm sure you'll be pleased to know, are fairly brief this evening. Um, the next significant event uh, in just under a fortnight's time is the Depot Open Weekend on the 23rd and 24th of September. Uh, that will be preceded, as we've got into the habit of doing, by on the immediate Friday before, which will be the 22nd, uh, for friends only between 12 and 4 in the afternoon, uh, prior site and opportunity to spend uh, at the friends sales store. So um, before the hordes of the weekend get to the goods, uh, if any of you want to come along on the Friday just for the friends store, we always have to say that general limitations to the depot uh, won't be possible. Uh, but between 12 and 4 on the Friday before the Depot Open Weekend, the Friends Sales Store will be open. Uh, the Depot Open Weekend itself is free to <coughs> friends. Uh, you can free book for that, I think, as a, uh, as a zero cost. I'm not certain that you just bring your membership card, I guess. Um, the theme is London Uncovered, uh, and there's going to be uh, a focus on uh, fabric, and particularly moquette in some of the presentations and the talks, but all the usual facilities of the depot will be there, sales store, the friend's sales store for the public, the museum shop, uh, heritage buses back on the menu again after uh, an absence in the spring weekend, uh, and the active miniature railway, uh, and some of the heritage buses out on display uh, in the back area as well. So that's the depot open weekend. Um, our next meeting here is on Monday the 2nd of October. Um, interestingly, he, the speaker is Leon Daniels, uh, Managing Director, Surface Transport, TfL. Um, I say interestingly because Leon announced his retirement last week. Um, as we meet on the 2nd of October, he will still be Managing Director, Surface Transport. Um, the general title he'd given us was uh, a presentation on his lifelong passion for buses, uh, which has included uh, a stint as the longest serving managing director. Um, so with rather appropriate timing, I guess, he'll be able to give us a, a sort of retrospect on, uh, on, all that, uh, on all that career. But that's on the 2nd of October. That undoubtedly will be a very popular meeting. Our plan will be to put it on the website for reserving a place uh, tomorrow. Uh, and uh, those of you who are quick on the button, uh, we'll get a place, we'll have a few unreserved, uh, but if it gets very, very popular, um, as Leon's obviously going to have a bit of time on his hands now, we might ask him back to do a repeat um, <laughs> from day to date. Uh, I very much doubt that's going to be true, actually, if my experience of retirement and some of yours is true. But, uh, so anyway, Leon Daniels on the 2nd of October, and just to look further ahead beyond that, uh, the subsequent meeting on the 6th of November uh, is Chris Nix sharing some of his uh, thoughts and experiences on Hidden London once more, different aspects of Hidden London from his previous presentation. That too will be a popular event, but that one we are planning to repeat, and the full details of this will be in the next magazine in a few weeks' time. We're going to repeat Chris Nix's presentation here uh, on a later date in November at Acton, so that will hopefully take a bit of the, a bit of the pressure off uh, attendance here. You can do it at Acton, but not both, please. Uh, right, um, I should say before we start the formal presentation uh, that we have the doubtful honour of being the very first people to use the new equipment in the uh, Cubic Theatre. Um, you can see some of it around the room. You can see, I think, a rather brighter and better display in here, but certainly outside. Uh, all seems to be working well. I think this is for Micah, but I'll touch it as if it was wood. Um, we are, I think, hostage to the fortune of um, being the pioneers in use of the room, but it's been fairly extensively tested this afternoon. Our speaker's been playing with all the wonders you can do up here of zooming in and out of pictures and all sorts of things. Um, so hopefully it will all go well. Um, our speaker is Mark Smithers. Um, I'm going to uh, talk from... the introduction to the book which Mark has produced uh, on the subject you're going to talk about tonight, tonight which is uh, the Royal Arsenal Railways. Railway. <laughs> 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 um, as far as I know, the book is available 
the shop uh, if you come back to, uh, to buy it. But I'm going to uh, use as the introduction the words which I presume Mark himself wrote. Uh, and it says, Mark has had a virtual long life interest in the history of industrial and narrow gauge railways, uh, in addition to being the author of two previous books um, on the subject, he's been a contributor to most of the major specialist railway journals over a period of uh, spanning three decades. He's also been involved in historical research used in the construction of replica narrow gauge steam locomotives, both full size and large scale model form. Um, one of his passions, as obviously the title of the book suggests, is the railway of uh, the Royal Arsenal, a fascinating area even now. If you go and have a look, a lot of it's been redeveloped, but a lot of the history uh, and the artifacts are still there if you know where to look. Uh, and I guess and hope that uh, with Mark's guidance, uh, we may get a few tips on that as he progresses. But without further ado from me, I'll introduce Mark. Right. Hello, can everybody hear me? Now, most of you will be familiar with the long and varied history of London's railways, which covers everything really from the glamorous main lines to the underground and various industrial enterprises. But the subject of tonight's lecture had a unique role in this country's history in that it supported the Royal Arsenal, an enterprise which sprang up from piecemeal beginnings during the years following the restoration of the monarchy in 1660, to the first world to, to its to reach a height during the First World War, at a time where it employed se over 72,000 people, had a river frontage of three miles and a depth of one mile, effectively. Now, the origins of the railways in this in the arsenal, of course, go back to the authorisation of a primitive system in 1824, <coughs> which sadly there is little mechanical detail of, but in some respects probably greatly resembled the Surrey Iron ra Railway at the time. It was a horse-worked carriage line, essentially. Now, the arsenal at this stage was, was divided into several different departments, and over the ensuing three decades, similar railways sprang up in, in what's now the western part of the arsenal complex. But the departments weren't always friendly towards one another, and it, even on some cases, it was known for one to take another department's line up. <laughs> Organize, that true organisation only really came with the coming of the South, the South Eastern Railway's connection through the famous hole in the wall in the Arsenal's perimeter in 1859, which dictated, of course, that the, rail, the, the main railways in the Arsenal had, had at last to fall into line and be built to the, the standard gauge, of course, currently in use. Prior to that, there's very little detail, but some detail in the National Archives suggests that they had a gauge of 3 foot 10. Now, at this stage, the Arsenal did not possess any of its own locomotives, and any mechanised workings would have, been, would have been undertaken by the South Eastern Railway. Now, if I can just pull up a map. see here, this is the point where the hole in the wall was. This is the original entrance point of the South Eastern Railway's connection into the Arsenal itself. Now, now, the Royal Engineers Committee had been very impressed in the 1860s with the potential offered for moving relatively heavy loads in confined spaces by the 18-inch gauge railway systems used within crew works, as pioneered by John Ramsbottom. These were discussed, in fact, in the Engineer magazine in 1866, and the Royal Engineers, in fact, sent a subcommittee to visit the, the line in the old works there. It was decided, owing to the influence of Royal Engineer officers, initially that a line of a similar gauge should be laid down in Chatham Dockyard. 
and this used cast iron tram plates. In fact, it was an experimental method. And we'll come on to these now. This is an example of the type. In fact, this is taken later on in Woolwich Arsenal. But as you can see here, they had checker plate surface for brick. And they were cast in sections approximately six feet long. Now this is this is the this is the type that was eventually adopted at Woolwich. But initially at Woolwich, steam locomotion was was adopted on 18-inch gauge as part of a mixed gauge with the standard gauge then in use. And this is the locomotive that they used. She was Manning Model Works number 353 of 1871. And you can see that she was arranged, in fact, to be able to haul standard gauge rolling stock as initially built. We had this rather ugly extension on the buffers. Shown to advantage here. Now, the initial locomotive that had been used by John Ramsbottom was designed for use in a rather confined lateral space, had very small cylinders, and a boiler really only suitable for intermittent demand. It had a cylindrical firebox. So what was required at Woolwich was a locomotive that could stand rather greater demands. And this, in fact, sponsored a new line of narrow-gauge locomotive evolution. This line of evolution had effectively started with Isaac Walt Bolton, in fact, a few years earlier, in Ashton Under Line, where in order to get a decent firebox, what he did was to have outside frames, as you can see here, which ran the full length of the locomotive between buffer beams, and a firebox that sat behind the wheel set, the rear wheel set. But unlike later narrow gauge developments, his locomotives were geared, they were indirect derived, as you can see here. Now, Manning Wardle, of course, as you, most of you will be aware, were one of the Leeds locomotive builders. And, and uh, importantly, their neighbours were Hunslet Engine Company, of course, which turned out to be longer lived. Now, in the preceding year, 1870, to the Manning Ward locomotive, Lord Raglan's construction. Hunslet had built a locomotive called Dinoric, which you can see here. And again, we have full length outside frames, outside cylinders, and direct drive with the normal locomotive type firebox. And this perhaps may be termed the Leeds Mainstream. You will, many of you will probably recognise this as the type of locomotive that evolved into the Quarry Hunslets. But of course, this particular, this particular manifestation of it proved to be a blind alley. It, 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 it was rather too cumbersome, and the cylinders were set too low. It sustained damage in service. But Manning Wardle, of course, initially developed two strands here. for The, the first one for Woolwich Arsenal, and another strand for Chatham Dockyard, which you see had rectangular frames and a shorter overall foot plate length.
But will its strand evolve into a mature form, which you can see in this drawing? We think the main frames were actually designed in the arsenal. But you can see here the drop frame at the rear to give the, give the driver a bit more room, basically. Uh, a bevel geared handbrake. And nearly all the other standard features. But do notice this buffer beam. This was a standard Manning wall feature that Woolwich really took to its heart. Many of its early locomotives on, on, on the Arsenal's railway system had this type of buffer beam. In all 13 locomotives of this Manning wall design operated on, 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 within the Arsenal, the last was built in 1889. And there's the last one built. There were pressures to have locomotives from other builders. In 1878, we had this solitary design from Vulcan Foundry. You can see based on the Manning Wall design, but with a long, bigger cylinders and unfortunately a longer wheelbase, which didn't endear it to the operating crew. It wasn't that long lived, in fact, it was scrapped in 1915. Now, in 1873, the official pure narrow 18 inch gauge system of the Royal Arsenal railway system opened in January. And Lord Raglan, of course, hauled the inaugural trains, the, the first man in Wardle. And the railway systems initially, although they were operated by the separate departments still, they were all put under the control of Colonel Frederick Beaumont, who will be well known, of course, for his experiments with firearms and with channel-channel boring machinery, and also with compressed air locomotives for tramway and possible channel tunnel use. Now, Beaumont in fact used the Arsenal's railway system as a test bed for his ideas, and he built a, a narrow gauge compressed air locomotive as early as 1877. He ordered for comparison with it, in fact, this little steam locomotive, which in fact was built to the same design as the later Patton Crew Works logo by Francis Webb. Again, it wasn't really big enough to be much use in the arsenal, and it appears only have been really used in the comparison of his early experiments. <coughs> At this stage, shortly before this stage, of course, it had been decided to have in independent, uh, independently owned standard gauge steam like when it was on the, on, on the arsenal railway system. First of these was, was initially called the Gunner. In fact, it was it was made again by Manning Wardle. It was a class standard class H, 12-inch cylinder locomotive, works number 515 of 1875, I believe. And it's seen here in this engraving in the Illustrated London News, hauling an 81-ton muzzle-loading naval gun. In fact, on a proof sled. The locomotive was soon renamed the dri renamed Driver, in fact, and a new gunner was built, capable of hauling bigger loads. There it is. It was built with 15 inch by 21 inch cylinders, but we've got a bigger loco. And uh, there it is. Now, of course, at this stage, you were starting to see the, the specialised rolling stock that, that, that the Royal Arsenal needed, particularly, particularly <coughs> wagons that could, harry, could carry guns, and also the proof sleds for testing them. And uh, there were also <coughs> there was also a barge for conveying these sleds equipped with rails for testing at Shubrinesse. I think that's it. 
there. It was called initially Magog. There we are. It was actually a converted sailing barge with uh, doors in the stern end, in fact. And there's the gun being loaded to go to Shubraness. So we can see here the, the beginnings of the development of it as a specialist railway system in its own right and as a test bed. So you can start to see the system's importance at this stage. Bowman went on to test compressed air standard gauge locomotives <coughs> on, the, on the Arsenal system, as you can see here. This was the second of his two Manning Wardle standard gauge locos. The boiler pressure actually was about a thousand psi, in fact, as charged up from a from a line side compressor. Before, it, of course, it naturally fell away during operation. The principle of working was very much like a steam locomotive in terms of the cylinders, except, except that you had sprung plug valves work from the eccentrics and not slide valves. Unfortunately, Beaumont's ambitions, of course, went rather than his money, and uh, there's a rather tarse note in the Manning Ward archives in Leeds, in the uh, West Yorkshire archives, where in fact they wanted to place an order for four more of these locomotives and Manning Wall simply were not prepared to uh, grant him the credit and to allow him to uh, pursue his ambitions, basically. This locomotive, nonetheless, is believed to have run on the New York elevated test and may have been and are certainly one of the very few, if not the only, Manning Wardle locomotive to, to run on the USA metals. There's another of Beaumont's creations. In fact, this, this thing was essentially a forcel in a quadruple expansion compound, in fact. Its cylinders were in a ratio of 1 to 9, 1 to 3 to 9 to 27 in volume, in fact proved to be rather, rather too complicated for its own good and a total failure at the end of the day, but there it is. <laughs> Built by Greenwood and Batley, another Leeds manufacturer, in fact. Now, of course, there was quite a development in gunnery between uh, 1876 uh, and 1887. And eventually another barge was ordered, so that gun barrels of 16.25 inch calibre and over 100 tonnes could be carried. And there is one being tested at Shoebrunes, having been conveyed there by the then new barge GOG. Two new proof slaves were in fact that were built at this stage. One of which in fact survives, preserved in Hampshire. It featured in a documentary in fact on the I think it was Channel 4 or Channel 5, and it was, was, was loaned to Holland, in fact, next exhibition in the uh, Railway Museum, National Railway Museum there. But it was actually a product of the Royal Carriage Department of Woolwich in 1886. The locomotive in the picture, in fact, was called Nicholson. It was a, started life as a standard Manning Wardle Contractors K class, 11 inch loco. Operated, it was purchased for use on the Shoebrun S military railway. But ended its days actually as part of the Royal Arsenal Railway stock. In fact, it was scrapped in 1916. Now, getting back to the narrow gauge locomotive development, other manufacturers, of course, as I said, wanted a slice of the action. And after the After the uh, efforts of Manning, Ward and Vulcan Foundry and, and, and the solitary uh, crew works type local which was built by Fox Walker and Company of Bristol, we have Hustle Clark's contribution. The local called Carinard, built in uh, 1884, seven inch local, seven by 12, I believe works number 268. There were two of them initially and they were, it came on to be built in five variations in fact over a period of uh, over 30 years. But you can see it's very similar in, in its general layout to the Manning walls. You have the high firebox, the domeless boiler, full legs frames and everything. It's very much a Leeds locomotive. But uh, the deficiency of this variant was not quite enough foot plate room. <coughs> An 
that was the solution, simply to lengthen it at the cab end. Yeah. Also, they, they just supplied more sanding apparatus, but uh, essentially mechanically it was the same. The valve gear, in fact, was derived from a two-foot gauge design several years earlier. There was a variant, in fact, another variant, a cut-down variant. I must ex explain that this stage, really, the, the railway equipment was being ordered by three departments, the Royal Gun Factory, the Royal Laboratory, and the Royal Carriage Department, which were still independent entities, although the order, the order locomotives were pretty much of the same designs. This one is Royal Laboratory number six. They either tended to carry names of a military connotation or they had departmental numbers. This is one with departmental number. <coughs> the purpose built, though, okay, for the Royal Arsenal system, of course, uh, Bag the, the standard firm of Bagnell, of course, very well known firm, they made one contribution in, in terms of Ajax which had some standard components with the Huswell locos, but uh, clearly intended to be the prototype of the class, it nonetheless remained a solitary representative. Classic inverted saddle tank, Bagnell Loco. Now in 1891, the railway system was unified, in fact, to form the Royal Arsenal Railways. And uh, I'm a Lieutenant E.P.C. Giraud, who went on to be an assistant to uh, Lord Kitchener, in fact, in the Sudan, after his spell at Woolwich was over in 1895, and for a short while during World War I. During this period, or lead up to it, There had been some diversification in terms of standard gauge locos. I mean, there had been quite a few Manning Wardle products, both intentionally built for the uh, Royal Arsenal Railways. Some were acquired from the Suakin, the Suakin Berber Railway fiasco of 1885, which uh, resulted in Gladstone's downfall from office. Some came to the Royal Arsenal Railways that way, and of course, a small number simply second hand from contractors. But uh, in 1888, Hawthorne Leslie was turned to for a new logo called Bombard. There it is. <coughs> there was also a Vulcan Foundry product called Vulcan, which, is a, which was built in 1893. And... Uh, Survived long after its career at the Royal Arsenal. It wasn't broken up in, in Norfolk until 1951, but uh, a very similar locomotive by the same manufacturer, also called Vulcan, survived in preservation today. <coughs> Huxwell Clark Loco Cyclops, about 1895. <laughs> this was destined to be a tragic near miss. It survived, in fact, after, after sale by the Arsenal until 1964 being the last 19th century Royal Arsenal locomotive in existence. There's a view quickly of the Bird Gog, in fact, yes, this, this is the one used to uh, transport the big guns to uh, shoot Burnett. There it is in his la la later life. <coughs> now then, shortly after unification, the Royal Arsenal Railway, which was by now over 60, well over 60 miles in extent, of course, we must remember, became famous for another piece of experimentation. Hmm. 
the search for more safe forms of motive power than steam, of course, in an, in an explosive environment, did not end with the failure of the compressed air experiment. In 1896, this eight inch gauge locomotive was in uh, order from Hornsby of uh, Grantham. It was actually a standard Horn Hornsby oil engine in many ways, just mounted on a locomotive chassis with a gear transmission. Two notable features, it employed the cooling system, which a lot of agricultural stationary engines of the type employed, which is essentially a, a trickle down water system, circulating water system. The other thing is, although, although it was smaller than the size normally used for stationary engines to employ such a system, it also had a compressed air reservoir filled by a hand pump, which was used to start the engine. Some more detail here at the rear end. There, in fact, is the turning mechanism. Well, this fan, sorry, this fan, in fact, yes, it's a turning mechanism. This fan worked a, a, a burner that primed the hot bulb. It had a hot bulb system as well, in fact, this engine, yes. That's what that was for. But uh, there it is anyway. You can see the controls for the gears on the pedestal here. There's the flywheel, there's the connecting rod. And the reversing and speed control gears are here. Probably worth putting the drawing on it up actually, just to show you in detail how it all uh, hung together. That's a scrap view of the details on the other side. You can see there the handle and plunger for the starting compressed air reservoir. This was a crucial development, of course, in uh, locomotive history. These locomotives remained in service right up to World War I, in fact. I mean, they weren't universally liked. I mean, it was very early days, but uh, they, they made an important contribution to the Arsenal's effort at the time. Now, the other major influence, of course, in the uh, 1890s, from the narrow gauge point of view, was the fact that uh, Following the uh, Suakin fiasco, the 18-inch gauge locomotives that had been built for that enterprise went to the Royal Engineers at Chatham, at the School of Military Engineering <coughs> tramway. And also some were used on the Chatham Eastern Defences system of the same gauge. In, the eight, in 1896, a policy decision was taken by the Royal Engineers not to use 18-inch gauge steam locos anymore for military, direct military purposes and the stock of them they had were transferred to the Royal Arsenal Railway with certain modifications that were necessary, such, to the, such as to the buffers and draw gear. So consequently the RAR was faced with an influx of locomotives that it hadn't originally wanted, but that it now had to accommodate. Amongst them, we had this bagel design. There were five of those with a four-foot couple wheelbase and a rather temperamental pony truck design, they weren't that popular and only three of them were still around at the end of World War I on the system. There were five locomotives built to this Fowler design. You will notice the offset drive, that there's a protection in fact on the coupling rod where the, where the drive to the connecting rod takes, takes off. That is to get the cylinders away from obstructions on the ground, in fact. 
Prior to this, Fowler was a builder design of Logo called the Greg and Bede, an indirect drive system, where you had a jack shaft and the cylinders drove onto that at a higher level. But of course, that uh, was rather cumbersome and didn't lend itself to fitting the locomotives with bigger than about five inch cylinders. So they settled on this compromise design. After the Swacken came as design was well over, they even tried their luck at a new design and a pair of locomotives, which went straight to the Royal Engineers at Chatham, and each just had the conventional drive allied to Joy's valve gear. This type of valve gear is well known because the Linton and Barnstable Railway Manning Wardle locomotives had it. But it, its earliest use on the narrow gauge in, in this country appears to have been on the on the Midge class, built by Falcon Engine Company a year before this, this uh, Fowler design uh, came into being. There we go. So there we are, we had a dozen locomotives really that they didn't want, but they got. They built four more, they had four more locomotives from Hornsby. Now one problem with the original Hornsby 1896 design was the design here at the front end of this cross member really, which is it, you, you can see how it's attached to the, the cooling system and uh, to the frame. It's a rather convoluted thing. And also the weight distribution wasn't right. So three Hornsby locos were built really with the same, basically the same engine system, but uh, an improved, a, a bigger cooler area and a leading pony truck. The same design as the Fowler, 04 Sioux tanks in fact, they were made by Fowler, those, those leading trucks, but uh, put at the front to make a 24 North. Three of these, there they are. There was also a design with opposed pistons in fact, built in 1904, which no photograph survives of. But uh, the drawings do, but uh, take a bit of reconstruction. But uh, here's my reconstruction of the uh, the two four zero arrangement, just so you'd have a look at. And that's how they, how you would see the cab view and everything, and the uh, the, res the the compressed air starting reservoir, that big circle down there covering one of the wheels. That's there. And right on the on, on the extreme right, the gear and reversing controls. <coughs> there was one odd ball of a locomotive that seems to have turned and got into the connection. I, I said a dozen locos, actually, well, there was at least one more, and that was a conversion that came from Chatham, and that was this conversion of a, an experimental local called the Handy Side which was built for our possible involvement in the Balkan War of the late 1870s between Russia and Turkey, which never happened because Gladstone and Israeli took opposite sides, in fact. And uh, these things, as built, had a mechanism where they could grip the rail and haul wagons up progressively, caterpillar style, up by high steep inclines. This had been taken off this logo, along with its leading pony truck at this stage, but... Uh, there it is. I don't know how many of the, of the six locos built to this design actually uh, came to Woolwich, but there is a photograph here. You see, one of them did. It had been scrapped by 1911. Now the last new design of narrow gauge locos before the First World War, that one. It was a Kerr Stewart design, Kerr Stewart to Stoke on Trent. <coughs> there were six locos initially to build, built to this variant. They were built to haul passenger trains in the Arsenal, which now had, had a well organised passenger service on the 18 inch gauge. And they were built to accompany some rather lovely bogey carriages. which can be seen here as the leading pair in this photograph, a later photograph, showing a later locomotive design, which we'll come on to. And these were built within the arsenal again, circa 1900. In actual fact, the floors were raised up inside the bodies. We now know that from 
there was a film that survives in the Imperial War Museum showing the doors being opened. But uh, having the low soul bars gave them a great stability on such a narrow gauge. Of course, with the build up to World War I at the beginning of, <coughs> standard gauge was not ignored, and we had several designs, of course, that were built during the, particular, during the approaches and the early years of World War I. Andrew Barclay was a supplier, as we can see here. <coughs> at the time of the Second World War, in fact, there have been a couple of Bagnell locomotives. There's an example. Uh, Hawthorne and Leslie have got back into the proceedings. As we can see here. And of course, Peckett's, and of course, this was their largest design they supplied to the arsenal, 15 inch, re really a successor to, to Gunner, to the later Gunner in the design. 15 inch loco. This loco eventually earned the sad distinction of being broken up at Woodham's Run the Ferry, which of course is famous for many of you, where many of our mainline locomotives spent a sojourn of before going to the preservation societies that they're now with. As to rolling stock development, many of the wagons, of course, and the carriages that were used on the standard gauge system at Royal Arsenal were second hand. In fact, London, Chatham, and Dover sold a whole batch of four wheel carriages off, which were the mainstay of the uh, standard gauge. Passenger network at the time of the World, World War One. On the narrow gauge, a distinctive type of wagon for carrying uh, munitions tra traffic had evolved, which, which had cast iron bogies with a, a peculiar kind of lateral suspension. The springs, in fact, were contained. Here that carried the cross members. So, in fact, the cross members could move. This type of, this type of wagon remained prominent on, on the 18 inch gauge really from the late 19th century throughout the remainder of the Arsenal existence. And there's the later standard version of it. There are also various odd designs of uh, wagon for hay and uh, other provisions and drop side wagons for various items as you can see here. You've even got, you've even, you've even got a shipping wagon in the, in, in, in the close up to you on the right you'll notice which has unmatching numbers for the body which was detachable and the chassis. <laughs> They were at the time World War I ended. Four ambulance wagons, in fact, which had been adapted from southeast uh, London Chatham and Dover vehicles. This one, in fact, had a peculiar flexible wheelbase. It wasn't a Clementon system. It was more like uh, two Bissell trucks, in fact. <coughs> really, and the thing had no fixed wheelbase. Must have been an absolute rough rider. Believed to have been made out of a mail van, in fact. But there it is. It was the last surviving ambulance vehicle. It's about to turn out.
Now, of course, particular importance for the vehicle on the stand the gauge adapted for gun conveyance. I've also met, I've already mentioned the proof sleds, but you had to carry your gun vehicles, and this is what Hurst Nelson and Motherwell came up with as, as a combo for doing it. Essentially, uh, three wagons each carried on four bogies. And uh, there is, I, th I think, surviving a very sketchy drawing of this, which I haven't got. This could carry gun barrels of over 100 tons. And there's a, tw there's a 20 ton pipe wagon. By this stage, of course, the railway system was at its maximum extent. Of the 18 standard gauge, you had a combined mileage of 147. There was, by, there was by this stage, of course, two connect. There were, by this stage, two connections, in fact, with the South Eastern and Chatham Railways, as it had become. Another one connecting to the Marsh sidings, as they were known, had been built in 1916, uh, and that was a 16-row siding complex. There was one final fling at a narrow gauge steam design. Well, that's built anyway. But, uh, and that was the Avonside Engine Company. Sixteen locomotives, six of which were coal fired, as, it, as, as including this example here for Manchester. They were adapted from a design used in the plantations in South Africa, in fact. And uh, both of those were built to two foot or two foot six gauge, but uh, they did it largely by shortening the wheelbase to three foot three from three foot three, sorry two three foot three from four foot six. And in fact, they had slightly larger boilers. But here we are. Different school of design outside Balstart's valve gear. You'll notice. better view. And the foundation ring of the firebox sat above footplate level, which meant you couldn't really have a saddle tank load. It was the centre of gravity, point of view, and stability. So they were side tanks. There we are. This is the last of the coal-fired survivors, Manchester. She lasted until 1954 in the service. Now, of course, come the armistice in 1918, there was a massive rundown in activities at the arsenal. If I can pull up the maps now, I'll show you the extent of how... This is the western extent of the arsenal, as how things stood, in fact, in 1920. The current historic buildings that you will see today are all really... <coughs> ..concentrated really in, in, in as far near, near to the far west, basically. Things like the brass foundry of 1717, there it's other, and the model-making room. You will uh, notice certain buildings marked in green. Now, many of you will be sh aware, I'm sure, of the abortive attempt to try and regenerate work at the arsenal in the immediate post armistice era by constructing a hundred locomotives, essentially to Maunsell's N-class design for the South Eastern Chatham Railway, in the hope of selling them somewhere else. This proved, of course, to be a disaster, as we all know. They were sold at a massive loss, I think, of over a million pounds at prices at the time then. Most of, them, most of the locomotives, the, the large share, of course, went to the South Eastern Chatham Railway, as you would expect, but uh, 
some went to Ireland, and uh, half a dozen were made into 264 tanks for the Metropolitan Railway. But it, the, 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 the lettering in green, of course, denotes buildings that were late, that were adapted shortly after World War One for this purpose. Going back to that first one, yeah. you'll see the three piers, in fact. The original pier, the T pier, which appears on many of the early maps. Early 20th century editions, the Iron Pier and the Coaling Pier. Now, the T pier has gone today, but you can still see the remains of the Iron Pier and the Coaling Pier, in fact, if you go to the site. Here's the next segment. That green bit around the top area, the Lillite factory, of course, is there. You can see further down, the, the, essentially the Royal Arsenal's sort of main line, basically, with the various buildings associated with the railways. Moving further east, you have the Marsh sidings. Now these were the sidings put in with the 1915-1916 connection, of course, with the southeastern Chatham <coughs> Railway. These big items marked in red, sort of centre left. You could also see the magazines to the right of those. Moving further up, you can see Burba Gate Station marked there, the Royal Arsenal Railways. And it goes on to the Phil Shell stores, as we see here. In the eastern end of the site, we have Cross Ness Explosives <coughs> Pier, with the railways running onto it. Show you the extent of how things were at that stage. This no longer exists. You can see some more magazines and Berber Station and Waiting Room with the Royal Arsenal Railway, of course, named after the abortive venture of 1885 in Stone. <coughs> the South Border Railway Network and Cross Manor Way with the police allotments in uh, <laughs> the extreme lower left of your picture. But that gives you an idea of an extent of the system at the time. And of course, all this suddenly was uh, collapsing. There was also more of the system in Woolwich Naval Dockyard, Royal Naval Dockyard, because this had been sold off to the Arsenal, in fact, in 1871-1872. And we had a physically isolated section of the Royal Arsenal Railways there as well. Again, mixed standard mixed gauge, some pure 18 inch gauge, and right at the western end, right over there, a mixed gauge, like a shed. This thing. That gives you an idea of the extent of your sign. There was, of course, post World War One, a massive rundown, and, and many of the <coughs> items of uh, locomotives and rolling stock were sold off, in fact, in the, in, in, from 1919 onwards. John Wake of Darlington, in fact, the, the dealer, in fact, bought a few of the narrow gauge locomotives. Including One of the Manning walls here, Fuse A, which is, to, as you see here, in fact, this locomotive had been rebuilt in the Arsenal in 1914, hence it's a totally different superstructure. 
I mean, the saddle tank, really, above, above the foot plate level is original. This went to Swanwick Collieries in, in uh, Derbyshire eventually, but only lasted until 1924, as, as far as we know. That one did at least get to run again. Here's Osiris, one of the bagels from, that went by the Royal Engineers in, 18, in the 1890s. 1919 scrawl on it, that's when, that, that's when J.F. Wake bought it, of course, from the Arsenal. Never ran again, scrapped it, we think, at the turn of the year, 1927, 1928. Same goes for another of the Manning Walls, Gordon. There we are. You can see in the background the much rebuilt pioneering internal combustion <coughs> locomotive, the Chases, the Hornsby locomotive of 1896. Standard gauge locos tended to be luckier. They tended to, they tended to uh, see more prolonged service. And I think I've shown you some of the ones that lasted a bit longer. But you then had a period, really, of really stagnant uh, progress for, for a, a decade and a half. In fact, some more of the narrow gauge locos were sold off in the 1930s. All but, all but uh, three of the, of the Avon sides. This is a line of them in the shed in 1932, in fact, but uh, by 1936 there were only three of them left. Come uh, to build up to World War II, yes, there is a revival in Fortunes, yes, there are some new locomotives ordered, I mean, even some are quite second hand, but it's nothing like on the scale of World War One. By this stage, there have been, been a the policy of dispersing ordnance factories around the country. It had been realised, of course, that the Royal Arsenal was a bit too near to the continent as, as to present a ready-made target, basically, for any, any invasion or uh, sabotage from there. And consequently, the Arsenal itself never assumed the importance that it had done in the 1914-18 conflict. Nonetheless, there were some new locomotives, both steam and diesel by this stage. There's a 15-inch standard packet, 1940 vintage. There were four Andrew Barclay diesels, three of which stayed on the site after the war. Here's one of them called Essex. Came the name originally carried by one of the Oswald Clark narrow gauge locomotives. And there's a John Fowler 150 horsepower job. They were, they were named Charles and Anne. Sadly, they don't survive today, but uh, there is a sister, at least one sister engine in preservation in Wales, so the type at least does survive. There was one last attempt to design a, a narrow gauge steam loco. It was ordered from Bagnell early in 1940, May 1940. In the end, second hand diesels proved easier to obtain. The order was cancelled. It was completed as a two foot gauge loco for the United Nations Relief Agency, in fact, after the war. And that's it as it was completed. But the uh, If you look at that, how it was designed, you can see that the full-length saddle tank was there. She was going to be an oil fire loco, of course, but uh, didn't see the light of day as originally projected. During the 1950s, of course, the Royal Arsenal Railway system is, is run down, basically, gradually. And, uh, Locomotives are sold off, mostly for scrap, or some, some for reuse. In fact, some go to places such as the Bista Military Railway, in fact, the diesel locos. But it's all run down. 1967 is the last standard gauge working, in fact, from the Royal Arsenal Railways. The site is, in fact, split into two in 1971. 
Royal Arsenal West and Royal Arsenal East, as many of you may be aware. This really end, ends the prospects of operation there for the three remaining narrow gauge diesel locomotives. Two of these are sold off into to preservation societies, while the, while the third is just, just goes to a scrap dealer and is broken up. Today there's still there are relics to be seen. Here's one of the pairs. That's a better view, it's the iron pier. There we are, it's the remains of the iron pier. You can see that. Uh, and that's the remains of the coaling pier, a distinctive L shape. Dangerous structure, sadly, you can't go on it anymore, but there it is. The modelling room where you saw our introductory photograph, in fact, with the Manning Wall loco fusee standing outside. That's what it looks like now. The guard houses, these feature in an earlier photograph for showing up with a railway line. Again, they're there, but no, actually no trace of the railway, unfortunately. and the swing bridge over the canal. Sadly, an attempt was made to restore this in the 1980s, but it uh, found it. They didn't even put a new mechanism in, but uh, sadly, that's how it survives today. But if you look at these grooves, in fact, here, they're arranged for standard gauge and mixed 18-inch gauge. So if you know where to look, there are important relics of the Royal Arsenal Railway still around now. As to, the, as to locomotives and rolling stock, a lot of the 18 inch gauge equipment found itself initially to Bicton Gardens in Devon. <coughs> There's the last surviving 18 inch gauge steam loco Woolwich. Which he was at Bicton. In fact, I took this photograph back in 1990. It's now owned by the Walton Abbey, Walton Abbey Gunpowder Mills Trust, and the scene in Walton, Walton Abbey here in this view, but is currently being restored at Cross Ness. There's Carnegie. Now, in 1934, at the time they got rid of uh, the, the, most of those Avonside 18-inch uh, gauge steam locomotives, they realised they needed a special locomotive to work the 18-inch gauge lines into the eastern magazines of the arsenal. And in fact, they came up with Hunslet. <coughs> Hunslet came up with a double bogey diesel design of 75 horsepower called Albert. That sadly was sold for scrap in 1961. But in 1954, an improved version had been built with 88 horsepower called Carnegie, and this survives. And this, this is seen here at Walton Abbey, where it still is now, having, of course, gone by a Bicton. The chassis, the chassis of the uh, explosives vans were used for passenger carriages at Bicton as well. The bodies have been destroyed by under safety regulations. There's one example there. As for standard gauge steam locos, there are two survivors. There's the best known of the two, 
Invincible on the Isle of Wight, currently, currently under overhaul, but there she is, actually, actually working. Now it's restored there to extent appropriate Royal Arsenal Railway red livery that was applied when she was new. Now the K-class manning walls from Swarkin and elsewhere are all gone, but you can go and see all with in an army mills in Leeds. Same design essentially. During World War One, the, the Royal Arsenal Railways were had to resort to hiring locomotives from the mainline companies owing to uh, the fact that the private builders were diverted on war work. One design they hired from the Great Eastern Railway was the uh, Orgy Tank Nielsen design. From number 228 was the logo they hired. Again, long gone, but we still have sister number 229. This is when she was at North Woolwich Railway Museum, now undergoing restoration for the flour mill. Museum and uh, flower, uh, flower mill workshops, rather, in the uh, Forest of Dean. In fact, I did a picture <coughs> on that in Heritage Railway. Another design, two locos hired in World War One. North Eastern Railway, H Class. One survivor based on the Middleton Railway, here seen visiting Beamish. Some class, mate. And the Arsenal bought one of its LNER descendants in 1939. That's now gone. It was scrapped as an RF base in Scotland in, uh, in the mid-1950s. But it, number 984, that was this is its sister, number 985. Again, based on the North Norfolk Railway normally, but here seen visiting Beamish. One final relic I'd like to show you, of course, of 18-inch gauge practice at... Uh, Waltham Abbey. Local river called Mars, built actually for the Chatham Eastern Defences Line, 1885. Found its way short, found, found its way for a short period to, to Woolwich in the early Edwardian period, then to Longwall Military Railway. The boiler, as we can see here, was cut away as an instructional exhibit. It's probably the earliest surviving bell bed boiler in the country. There it is at now at Waltham Abbey. So there we go. The RAR served its country. Long gone, but hopefully not forgotten. say it is a fascinating sight still even now although a lot of what Mark has shown us and spoken about is obviously been swept away by all the developments that have taken place more recently um, if you do walk around and I was privileged not only to walk around but to be guided around uh, a year or so ago um, it is remarkable how much where you, if you know where to look is still there track and, uh, and, and some of the buildings fortunately um, right ladies and gentlemen have we any questions if you have, could you put your hand up and we'll get a mic to you just so that we capture everything. Well, I'm right at the back, Richard. Uh, you mentioned uh, passenger workings. How e you mentioned passenger workings. How extensive was the passenger system at, at, its, uh, at its peak, presumably around the, the first well, World War It was very extensive. It, it, there were ten stations, in fact. Mm. And... Uh, it, they were worked at 30 minutes in 30 minutes intervals from one, really from uh, the main gate, effectively the, the Beresford Gate area, right up to uh, Bur Burba Station in the eastern end of the Arsenal. As you can see, I think I showed it to you on the map. And uh, the, the, they wore uniforms and everything at the start. And uh, you've probably seen in the photograph. I think I showed you there were four carriages and trains a lot of the time. They. Uh, the tow strap carriages, which were later ones, in fact, in 1916, they had a capac capacity of 40 passengers each. And the, uh, the 1900 ca carriages had a capacity of 32 passengers each. So it was quite an extensive system. I mean, it was all, 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 
it was working sections linked by telephone, but the only thing it didn't have, of course, was semaphore signalling, which uh, gave rise to quite a few accidents, unfortunately. And I mean, there are even letters from people who worked in the arsenal talk of trains bouncing off each other. <laughs> and you'll notice that many of the photographs of the locomotive show collision damage. And they'd have been used, by, presumably, by people to get to and from their place of work on yes. the site. But were they used also internally, if you needed to move around within the site? Yes, yes, obviously so, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. There was a special superintendent saloon, of course, for the big wigs. In fact, in fact, there were two of them. But we, 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 we could see that, you can you could see by closely examining the photograph, a lot of different, different bolting of the frames, and the fact that there were drop-like windows in the ends of one and not the other. There are at least two of these vehicles. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? One right in the middle there. <coughs> what was the speed restriction of the um, network there? It was normally meant to be 12 miles an hour on the standard and 8 on the narrow. But it, it's quite clear from the film at the time that this was exceeded. And so the, this is one of the problems, of course. You can imagine the intensity of operation. You've got these 72,000 employees working 24 hours of the day. I mean, it was all shift work, basically. It was producing, because of course we were very behind in our shell production. It's one of the famous scandals of 1915, as we all know. It's when the military Ministry of Munitions was formed. So yes, obviously the speed limits were exceeded, but uh, in fact there, there are accounts even in the Second World War, and, and the line was mainly standard gauge working by then of uh, the drivers saying, be, let's, be, let's say, being a little bit over eager with the regulator. Okay, anybody else? Wait for a short while. All right, I'm going to ask the last question in that case. Um, you mentioned, Mark, that there's some restoration work going on both at um, Waltham Abbey and at Cross Ness. Am I right in thinking there is a sort of proposal that there could be some railway restored towards the Crossness site? Yes, it's very much up in the air at the moment. I mean, it's, it's the reason why I've not discussed it in great detail, of course, inherited, well, not at all inherited railway at this stage, is because it, everything's a bit up in the air. There's, there's, there's not too much want to be known at the moment, basically. There are a few technical difficulties in the restoration of the locomotive, is one of the problems. Right. So we, need, we need to be ironed out. Watch this space. Very, so case, very much a case. The world, of the world is locked on yes. by the internet. So. I am actually mm -hmm. involved in the project to uh, recreate another of the 18-inch cages, because uh, one of the crew works ones, in fact. And in fact, I've, do, I've done a feature on, on that, in fact, which will be published shortly. Okay. Which magazine? Heritage Railway. Yeah, sure. The right. logo is called Nipper. In fact, it, 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 it's a sister engine to PET in the NRM, but it will be working. Which PET, of course, no longer is. Okay, right, we're nicely on time. The, uh, the old red clock from the previous uh, version of this uh, room and its IT equipment is all flashing away in the background there. Um, before I thank Mark, uh, just a reminder, as I'm sure you won't need, that our next speaker uh, is Leon Daniels. Um, when we go outside uh, for our usual uh, drinks and nibbles, uh, there will be the usual bowls in which to put the most generous donation you can muster, please, uh, to help us cover the cost of those. Um, but our thanks to Mark um, for two reasons, really. One, for sharing his incredible knowledge um, on the railways about which he has spoken. Um, another uh, plug, I think, for the book, because although I haven't yet got all the way to the end, I think I'm on chapter five at the moment, um, it is uh, a remarkable summation of knowledge and probably everything you ever wanted to know about the Woodwich Arsenal Railways. Um, so if you have had your interest tweaked by this evening, then do think about that book published by Pen and Sword, I think, from memory. Um, but thanks to Mark for sharing his knowledge, and particularly uh, for being the first to, uh, to use the new equipment. Like everything IT, it seems to offer all sorts of additional facilities, um, many of which I'm sure are going to be useful, and some of which Mark used. Uh, but like everything, it needs a bit of time to get used to it all. So somebody had to be first. Uh, Mark would probably not have chosen to be first, but he dealt ma magnificent, magnificently with it uh, and seemed to be taking out the right selection of photographs from what I know was a much, a much bigger file of photographs that he brought with him. Um, so our thanks to Mark, please, in the usual way.